Hello, this is Chef John from foodwishes.com with corned beef and cabbage shepherd's pie. That's right, my favorite corned beef and cabbage recipe and my favorite shepherd's pie recipe are the same recipe. And while this does involve a few extra steps, when compared to your classic traditional boiled corned beef dinner, the payoff at the end is well worth the extra effort. And by the way, a few extra steps does not mean this is not easy. This is actually quite simple to put together, as you're about to see. So with that, let's go ahead and get started by boiling our corned beef. And by boiling, we mean gently simmer. And what we'll do is take our three and a half to four pound piece of corned beef and transfer it into a pot, along with some onions and celery. And then as you may know, every corned beef comes with that little package of secret herbs and spices. So we'll wanna be sure to add that as well. And then what we'll do is add enough cold fresh water to cover the beef. And no, we don't need to add any salt to the water. All right, the corned beef has plenty. Oh, and I should mention when you go to buy your corned beef, you'll usually have a choice between the flat lean ones and then the thick fatty ones. And guess which one I think you should use. Oh yeah, the thick fat one if you can get it. And then what we'll do is bring this up to a boil over high heat. And yes, if you want to skim some scum, go ahead and skim some scum. But personally, I'm not skimming any scum. I think those are just foamy proteins. And then once our pot's boiling, we'll back our heat down to low. And then we'll cover this and we'll let it simmer gently for three and a half hours. And believe it or not, that's it. And then if everything goes according to plan, about three and a half hours later, your corned beef should look like this. And we will go ahead and stab that with a giant fork and remove that to a bowl. And if you don't have one giant fork, use two regular forks, but be very careful. And that's it. Once our beef's been bowled, we'll simply let that cool down before we cut it up. And while we're waiting for that, we'll go ahead and cook our vegetables in that same amazing flavorful broth which I do at this point like to taste for salt, and hopefully it's perfect. But if it tastes like it needs some, go ahead and throw some in. And then what we'll do is bring that back to a boil over medium high heat, at which point I'm gonna cook a couple small savoy cabbages, or just regular green cabbage if you want. And once our cooking liquid is boiling, we'll go ahead and transfer that in. And after taking out the core, as you can see, I cut mine into about two inch pieces. But of course your sizes may vary, since you're gonna be the one cutting it. And once we get that all settled down and it comes back to the boil, what we'll do is cook this for five minutes or until that cabbage just starts to soften and sweeten up. Okay, don't forget all these ingredients are gonna cook again once they've been shepherd pied. But anyway, we'll go ahead and remove those to a bowl and we'll let that cool down while we move on to cooking the next vegetable, which would be some thickly sliced carrots. And we are pretty much gonna do the exact same thing. We're gonna cook these for about five minutes or so until they just start to soften up. And again, that's going to depend on how thick you cut them. But that's fine, because you're going to check and test them. And when we think those are done, we'll go ahead and fish those out. And we'll let those cool down alongside our cabbage. And once those are set, we can move on to the last component, which would be the potatoes we're going to mash to do the topping for our shepherd's pie. And I'm thinking we should also reduce our heat down to medium, since we don't want our liquid level reducing down too far as the potatoes cook. And until you've had mashed potatoes, Made with potatoes that have been boiled in corned beef cooking liquid? You, my friend, have not had mashed potatoes. In fact, if they sold corned beef broth at the store, I would buy it just to make mashed potatoes with. And then if we want while our potatoes are cooking, we can go ahead and slice up our corned beef, which to make things easier should ideally be fully cooled. And what we'll do first is try to find that fatty seam between the two pieces of meat, and then we'll go ahead and separate it right there. And by the way, you can only do this if you got the good end of the brisket. You people that got stuck with that flat lean end can just start slicing. Speaking of which, no matter what piece of corned beef you ended up with, we're going to want to identify the direction of the meat fibers and cut across those. Or as we call it in the business, slicing across the grain. And I generally don't like to trim off too much fat, but if you do come across a giant solid piece, you can always trim that off if you want. And right here you can see exactly why we prefer that thicker end of the corned beef. I mean, look at that marbling. So we'll go ahead and slice that up, and then we'll head back to the stove to fish out our potatoes. Assuming, of course, they're fully cooked and tender enough to mash. Oh, and do not, under any circumstances, throw away that liquid. All right, we are definitely gonna use that. And then to our cooked potatoes, we will add a little touch of butter. Some salt, of course. But be careful, because that cooking liquid was already seasoned. We will also do some freshly ground black pepper, as well as a few shakes of cayenne. And then last but not least, we will pour in some milk, at which point we'll go ahead and mix, smash, and mash this until it's very smooth. 
And yes, in case you're wondering, you are supposed to mash the potatoes with the butter first and then add your milk or cream or whatever liquid you're putting in. But for this, it really doesn't matter because I don't mind if there's a few little lumps here and there. The only thing you got to be careful about is don't mash too aggressively at the beginning because that milk will definitely splash out. Okay, so start off kind of slowly. And then once it starts to break down and smooth out, you can pick up the pace. And then what we'll do once we mash that as smooth as we want is stop and toss in a handful of Irish cheddar. Or of course the cheddar of your choice. All right, American, English, mild or sharp, whatever you're into. I mean, you are after all the Billy Eilish of your casseroles Irish. And speaking of bad guy, while I don't care if you use Irish cheddar or not, I do care if you grate it yourself. All right, good guys and gals grate their own cheese. And that's it once that's been mixed in. We can herd all of our ingredients into a buttered casserole dish, starting with our cabbage, which looks like we have way too much. But all we need to do is give that a very firm pressing, and it should compact nicely. And then next up, we will transfer on our carrots and distribute them as best we can, and also give those a little bit of a pressing down before we place over a nice even layer of our corned beef. And as we do this, let's try to make sure we distribute those fattier pieces evenly so that way Patrick Murphy doesn't get all the fatty pieces and Seamus O'Connor doesn't get all the lean ones. So please try to mix things up. And then once we've achieved full corned beef coverage, we'll go ahead and pour in one cup of our beautiful corned beef broth to help keep everything nice and moist as this bakes. And then for the last step, we'll go ahead and spread over our mashed potatoes. But before we spread, we have to dollop. And if we do that before we start spreading, we're gonna ensure we get a much more even layer so we'll go ahead and use the back of our spatula to spread that out as uniformly as we can. At which point we're going to switch to a fork to not only do a little bit of fine tuning and make sure we have those potatoes spread all the way to the edge, but we are also going to use our fork to texture the top. And there's a million different designs you can do, or it may be more, but I like to go with the very traditional method of dragging the fork across this way, although we probably want to alternate directions so it doesn't start building up on one edge. And then once we've made marks by dragging our fork that way, we will do the exact same thing the long way to create a pattern that is actually not a pattern, which is what makes it such a great pattern. Okay, it ends up being kind of random, but on purpose. And then for one final touch, once that's been completely forked, as I like to sprinkle over a little more grated Irish cheddar over the top, which maybe possibly helps it brown up a little nicer. And that's it, our corned beef and cabbage shepherd's pie. It's now ready to transfer into the center of a 400 degree oven for about 45 minutes to an hour until it's beautifully browned, piping hot, and hopefully looks like this. And then I'm not saying we're smart, but if we were, we would let this sit and rest for about 10 minutes before we tried to serve it up, at which point we can grab a spatula and attempt to cut out a nice square. And yes, for a first piece that came out amazingly well, it's almost as if I had food styled it for like 10 minutes before placing it down. And then we will finish up with a few spring onions, which is what we call scallions when they're in a St. Patrick's Day video. And then for one last very important touch, let's go ahead and serve this with some of those amazing cooking liquids. So beautiful. And that, my friends, like I said in the intro, is not only my favorite version of corned beef and cabbage, but also my favorite version of shepherd's pie. All right, visually, texturally, and taste-wise, just magnificent in every way. And while there's absolutely nothing wrong with a traditional corned beef and cabbage and potato and carrot dinner, one challenge with that since everything's so wet, as soon as you slice your corned beef and serve up, I find that everything gets cold really fast. But here, because we have that delicious and beautiful mashed potato insulation, this is going to stay hot a long time. Plus, this takes all the stress and anxiety out of trying to slice the meat and portion the potatoes and portion the cabbage and vegetables. Okay, here, all that was taken care of during the layering process. So yes, there are a few extra steps involved, but for me to be able to enjoy a final product this amazing makes that little bit of extra effort more than worthwhile. Oh, and you didn't hear this from me, but this format is also great for stretching a little bit of corned beef a long way. So if you have a large clan to feed, I really do think this is a great approach. Which reminds me, one last thing. If you happen to have a bunch of smaller baking dishes, this technique is perfect for making smaller individual sized portions. So just something to keep in mind. But anyway, whether you do end up making these fun size or in one big casserole dish like we did here, either way, if you're a fan of corned beef and cabbage, I really do hope you give this a try soon. So please follow the links below for the ingredient amounts, a printable written recipe, and much more info as usual. And as always, in.
enjoy.